Steven Field Jr. <laughs> the, the first and the last name are Brazilians, but the <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> okay, Alvaro, uh, nice to meet you and uh, yeah, you can share your okay. okay, thank you very much, Professor Silvio. Uh, okay, see my presentation. Yep. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you very much. My name is Alvaro Neufeld Jr. <laughs> it's almost <laughs> the same. Uh, I'm professor uh, of production engineering at Federal University, Federal University of Santa Maria, Brazil. And today I will talk a little bit about the machine touch movement for sheet metal plasma cutting, specifically for rectangular cases. Uh, first of all, I will talk about the rectangular two-dimensional strip packing problem, a little bit about the equipments for the machine plasma cutting process, the objective of our research, the logical steps to, that conduct our comparison result, res, results, and uh, the remarks and future directions about uh, the study. The main objective, as you know very well, the main objective of the rectangular dimensional strip pack problem is minimize the height necessary to uh, arrange, pack, position in a series of uh, small rectangles into the strip, uh, satisfying phys both physical and structural, structural constraints. And also in our case, allowing the rectangles rotation and uh, satisfying the orthogonally uh, constraint. For the machine plasma cutting process, some equipments are fundamental uh, to cut sheet metal. Uh, first of all, the cutting table, uh, where the, 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 the sheet metal is positioned horizontally. The touch with a cutting nozzle, where a gas with a high speed uh, cross, uh, produced by the plasma cutting machine. And uh, finally, the CNC CAD display to insert the all input data necessary to cut the sheet metal and also to control the process during the operation. Our main objective of the, with this research is to compare uh, in some manner the machine touch movement behavior. Uh, for this, we adopted both optimal and alternative solutions for problem instances and uh, considering uh, also the rectangular sheet metal plasma cutting process. It's important to detail this because there are a lot of uh, types of uh, machine cut uh, process. And uh, the touch movement will be analyzed using comparative parameters that I will talk in the next slides. The practical demand of this research is related with an uh, industry uh, that weld uh, assembled trucks body works. Uh, in order that structural parts uh, are linked and uh, a metallic reinforcement weld that, that is a small rectangular piece is used to reinforce this weld. And uh, because of this, they uh, produce a lot of these small rectangular pieces. And it's necessary to, to, to use a, a solution that uh, in order to reduce the raw material used and also the machine touch movement to reduce the time necessary to operate, to, re to, to cut these uh, rectangles and uh, to improve the effectiveness of the, the industry. Uh, we propose three uh, steps to, to develop, to conduct of uh, this research. In the first moment, operational parameters must be defined based on the cut machine configuration. In the second moment, the technical parameters to obtain is a, a, a optimal solution and alternative solutions for each instance. And finally, the comparative parameters and the results obtained with the comparison between the behavior of uh, uh, the comparison parameters of optimal solution and alternative solutions. So for the operational parameters, the pass market cut system uh, was defined as a basis using the, the as a reference, the hyperterm power max 45 
machine and uh, some meetings for this specific machine are, are fundamental to be defined uh, as the sheet thick and as rectangles cut in distance until the cutting rule. Uh, these values of each operational parameter uh, are given by guidebooks, technical reports, experimental tests, and, and uh, mainly with the practical experience of the operators and the mechanical engineers of the, 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 the industry. And also, uh, all solutions were drawn uh, using the SketchUp. And uh, in a second moment, we use the uh, software called SheetCam to read the solutions from SketchUp and configure the machine uh, cutting, uh, uh, machine cutting machine, machine cutting. And uh, with this uh, configuration, we translate all this information to Mac3, Mac3 or another uh, software to read the CNCG code, the steps of, uh, of, uh, of the cutting process. Uh, to simulate in our case, but this software is also used in practice, <laughs> we use the simulate uh, mode to simulate the sheet metal cutting. And uh, with this, we can obtain the, the compar uh, comparison parameters of each solution that we draw. To obtain the solutions in the first moment, uh, we use it uh, as a constructive risk, the bottom left to fill approach to obtain uh, the first complete solution for each instance. And also uh, we use a tab search to obtain with a 200 uh, independent runs to obtain another uh, other solutions to improve the first solution obtained. With this, uh, we take into consideration two alternative solutions, the best obtained with the tab search and uh, another uh, random solution from the 200 independent runs that we developed. To obtain optimal solutions, we use a mixed, uh, we develop a mixed and integrated linear programming with a bottom left positioning based on the modeling proposed by Kemo et al. Uh, with uh, rotation, with the rotation condition. And uh, this, this model was implemented using the CPLEX uh, 12.5. The comparison parameters, uh, we, we described three main uh, comparison parameters for this study. The cut, that is the movement distance covered to cut the raw material, adding value to the process, is the, the effective cutting uh, or cut of the sheet metal. The displacement, that, that is the distance covered to move the third uh, to start a new cut. It's not adding value to the process. And the most important, uh, that is the time in seconds counted for the entire touch movement. Sum the cut uh, and the displacement time necessary to cut all rectangles. As the problem instances, a total of, of 15 scenarios were created based on the combination of problem characteristics as number of rectangles, object width, heterogeneity, aspect ratio to, in a, to organize, to better organize the problem instances. And uh, for each scenario, we, we select from the literature one problem instance. And there is small problem instances, no more than 20, 25 rectangles. And uh, to obtain the optimal solution, it was a, a prerequisite for us. And uh, with these problem instances, we obtained the first uh, comparison results uh, for the optimal solutions. For the alternative, uh, each alternative solution, the time, the cut and the displacement, uh, time in seconds, cut and displacement in millimeters. I will not talk about these numbers because it's so uh, boring for, for you and for me. I will talk, uh, uh, make a relation between the, the results obtained and the aspect, practical aspects verified uh, with all these numbers that I show to you. Uh, the first uh, aspect related with the practice of the, the cutting process is the adjacent cuts. 
The cut in the rectangle of cut distance is equal to zero. So a single cut is used to cut two adjacent rectangles. Uh, we can, with only one cut, cut two uh, adjacent parts of, of two rectangles. One adjacent part of two rectangles. This is a, suppose that we use a different cut distance, uh, three millimeters, four, five, uh, probably these adjacent cuts will change, the behavior will change because we need two cuts to cut two adjacent parts. So uh, with this, with these uh, adjacent cuts, we have several cut possibilities for the arrangement of the rectangles into the strip. Uh, first of all, and the more the, the simplest and the the, the, the simplest uh, cut is the strength cut that cover the shorter distance, and uh, in our case reduce the touch movement. That is very interesting for this uh, usage. The second option, the second most common option, is the non straight cut that if is most common in optimal solutions because the the objective uh, function of the optimal solutions is to reduce the height necessary, uh, reducing the raw material. So the, the rectangles will be uh, very well arranged, arranged into the strip. And the, the, the touch movement is not considered in that uh, modeling because of this is most common in, in optimal solutions. And the, the, the third most common is the, is the adjacent cut with more than one cut. I need two cuts using uh, in the middle of these two cuts a displacement movement. But the time to cut with this configuration increase. Uh, some results obtained uh, and related with this uh, aspect, for example, uh, for the instance PT30, PT, uh, uh, the, the two alternative solutions will obtain the same height, but the time cut and displacement for these two solutions are completely different because of the arrangement of the rectangles into the strip. Uh, the alternative one, we have more strain cuts uh, compared to the alternative two, because of because of this, we have this difference in the comparison results. The second aspect aspect analyzed by us is the displacement, uh, where where we verify that no direct relation between cut and displacement distance covered. There are no re relation between uh, uh, cover more uh, distance of displacement compared to to the the, the cut the, the, the cut distance, the cut movement. The displacement velocity is higher compared to the cut velocity and cannot be controlled because it's an intrinsic, uh, intrinsic configuration of the machine. We cannot co control. The cut velocity we can control, but the, the displacement no. So uh, we have a, a small example here with uh, choose uh, with a same uh, toy example with the same arrangement uh, with completely different uh, uh, cut configurations. And uh, we have here, uh, in the first case, a low displacement movements. In a second uh, situation, short displacement movements. And the, the effect of in practice of this is small, uh, considering the time consuming to cut all rectangles because of the right velocity of the displacement compared to the cut uh, movement. So in, in our results, we observe this in, on the instance PT6, uh, where the, the, the displacement between compared with the optimal solution, alternative one and alternative two are different, but the time required to cut all rectangles are almost the same because of the, 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 the cut movement is similar for these three uh, options. The third aspect analyzed was the was a question that uh, we still uh, working about it. That's on reduce how material or touch movement uh, aspects. Only for four instances, time and cut using optimal solutions are lower compared with alternative solutions. Uh, in a manner that uh, we, in some manner, we need to to, to treat with these uh, aspects combined probably with uh, mathematical modeling or into a heuristic, 
we need uh, a risk we need to 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 reduce in practice both raw material and touch movement together not separately because in the first example you have a lot of uh, waste of raw material in a second situation we have a lot of uh, movement uh, waste so we have these two words that must be combined in a certain manner the last aspect analyzed was the leveling cut effect that uh, we verified that the best type of arrangement to reduce the time recur required to cut all rectangles uh, because increase the number of strain cuts and we have here uh, example of uh, instance pt1 where the displacement was uh, uh, was was lower for the optimal solution compared to if the alternative, but the time required to, to cut all rectangles was lower to alternative one because of the strain cuts. We have 10 uh, low or small strain cuts for the optimal solution. And for the alternative one, we have more than 10 long strain cuts that, uh, that uh, improve the time, uh, reduce the time required to cut all rectangles. So based on this, in practice, the optimal solution could be not appropriated to cut uh, sheet metal, depending on the aspects analyzed, mainly the relation between the raw material used and the third uh, time spent to mo movement the third, uh, the, the third. We still develop the present research, uh, research, mainly related with the, the when the cutting distance is not equal to zero. I think that uh, the results will change a little bit. How, I don't know, <laughs> but we, we need to study this condition. Uh, and also in the one of the uh, most important future directions of our research is measure the economic impact of the relation between how material wasted and machine touch movement. Uh, in, a scal uh, in a scalable uh, industrial operational work journey, considering a normal uh, uh, work journey, um, to verify what is better, reduce raw material wastes or touch movements. The cost-benefit uh, the, the, the cost uh, relation between these two aspects, because raw material expensive but consumable inputs like a gas diffuser, touch nozzle, contact tips, and uh, uh, others are also expensive along the industrial operation. And uh, we need to verify these economic aspects. And finally, and finally for me, uh, I need to test more instances in each scenario. Considering all these aspects, we need to, 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 to find more instances for each scenario to verify uh, some uh, conditions and uh, verify what happened or if the results are, are, are the same for two different instances, for example, for each, in, in each scenario. Uh, I must to thank uh, a special thank for Trevisan Carrocerias and Tecnopump to give us the opportunity to, to develop this research. We still develop this research and uh, also the support uh, given by the CNPQ. Thank you very much. And uh, Professor Silvio. Yeah, thank you, Alvaro. Uh, okay, uh, and questions? Uh, I, I have, I think, uh, right. okay, Julia. Elsa, uh, Julia first, please. Thank you. Thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, and, and I think it's really valuable to kind of look into the solutions and see what's really going on and how that impacts the kind of broader operational aspects of the cutting. So that was really interesting. Um, one thing I didn't understand and, I, uh, and uh, it'd be useful for if you could clarify was around the displacement. I think you were talking about it on slide 15 or 16. And you said that you had no control over that displacement. So I was wondering, you know, what governs it or is it just completely random how it navigates through the cuts? Yes, uh, the displacement is a, it's a problem for us because uh, the input uh, for the uh, organize the cut, it's it's all focused on the cutting operation. The displacement is not considered because of the right velocity, because it's a black box for, included for us. 
we contacted the the, the 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 mechanical engineers and also the hyperterm hyperterm uh, uh, analytics and, uh, and the department of analytics and the we not obtaining a, a concrete answer about this. And uh, the, the, the advantage is that the displacement not, it's not uh, the impact of the displacement is not so, uh, it, it's not relative for the time. It's a good thing for us. But the bad thing that we need to, to improve, we need to understand better, uh, what is related with this displacement? Why the, 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 simula the, the software uh, simulation software not considering the, this uh, displacement to organize the cutting process? This is a black, black box for us, still a black box for us because we use the uh, commercial software that the, the practice uses to cut and uh, it's not uh, interested for for them understand the better understand this. Thank you. Okay. Elsa, nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you too. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, congratulations for your nice presentation, Alvaro. It is really interesting topic. See the practical things on it. And uh, I was wondering, since you have these uh, all decisions that you want to make. Uh, thinking about the multi-objective approach uh, regarding the, the types of cuts, the time, if you can measure it, okay? And uh, I don't know what uh, what you if, if you did something on this. Yes, I, I uh, actually I, I Mateus, that one of the co-authors, uh, still study about this. And uh, we try to escape from the multi-objective uh, approach because of our uh, knowledge, because of our skills. And uh, we try to, to, to use the touch movement uh, into the constraints to modeling, uh, to modeling a uh, milk. We try to do this this type of uh, of arrangements into the, the modeling, but uh, I believe that I, we need to try. I we need to 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 uh, organize the ideas as a multi-objective problem, considering yeah. both height and uh, time necessary to for the touch movement. I think, I think this trade-off is quite dependent on the demand, no? the waste and torch movement. Like if, it's, if you have a seasonal demand, then... Because of this, we need to, because of this, we need to, to analyze the economic aspects. Yeah. It's a black box for us. This economic uh, relation between the, uh, the, the use of consumables and the waste of raw material. It's still for us uh, completely unknown about this. That is the most, okay. most interesting cost relation. <laughs> Thanks, Alvaro. I think you need to move for the next talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So, Jean Francois. Hello. Can you share your screen? And... Of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you see? Hello? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Jean-François Côté. Today I'm presenting a joint work with uh, my colleague uh, Manuel Diori on a new way to represent a feasible solution in a packing problem. And this uh, new method, we call it the meet in the middle. So we consider a general packing problem, it could be a cutting packing problem. Uh, a cutting problem, yeah. Uh, in any dimension, so it can be one dimension, two dimension, or in three dimension, we have a set of items. Uh, each item has a, a weight in the dimension D. So it can be, uh, if we're in one di dimension, it would be a weight. Uh, in 2D, it would be a width and a height. Uh, in 3D, maybe uh, an additional length. And uh, we have to pack our items inside bins and each bin have a capacity in uh, the dimension D. We maybe have multiple bins or maybe a single bins. 
and uh, we cannot overlap the items uh, together inside the bins. And our objective is uh, is general. We minimize the number of bin, or we pack everything in a single bin, etc. Uh, we also suppose our values of our our integer, so uh, the capacity or the weights are, are all integers. And uh, so for this uh, set of uh, of uh, positions, for this set of solutions, uh, we are interested in applying them on. Uh, index-based formulations. And there are many, uh, many, many papers in the literature with an index-based formulation. We can think of scheduling problems where we have a task and uh, we have a variable deciding if the task start as a, at a specific time, or uh, we have a capacity-based uh, formulation like in the arc flow formulation for the bin packing problem where every node is a capacity usage and all the arcs are uh, an item. So typically, these models have a pseudo polynomial number of variables. They depend on the capacity and the number of items. And these, uh, they can grow uh, quite large when you increase the capacity or the number of items. We can see also these formulation in packing problems, in packing problems in 2D or in 3D. And typically, we have a variable x i t where uh, that decide if item i is positioned on coordinate t. We can see also these uh, formulation in the CVRP, uh, where the decision variables are x, i, j, q, uh, indicating if q units of a product are transported from i to j. Uh, this too is an index-based uh, formulation. So for this presentation, I'm uh, presenting the meet and the middle applied to the uh, to the orthogonal packing problem, but it can be applied to uh, many other uh, problems. So we have a set of items, and every item is in two dimension with a width and height. Uh, the bin has a width and a height as well. And our objective is to know if we can pack all these items inside the bin. And obviously, uh, no overlapping is allowed. So the uh, general set of, uh, of position is, uh, can be quite large. Uh, we can place uh, any rectangle inside, like at any uh, point inside the, uh, this area. And basically, uh, the left corner of an item can be placed uh, on the x-axis uh, in any of these uh, position in this interval. And we will have the same for the uh, y-axis. Uh, so this interval define uh, the feasible position for my item. And I will be interested in ways to place this item inside this interval. Um, mostly, I'm interested in ways I can reduce this interval because this interval is, is continuous. And I would like. Uh, something that is smaller because if it's continuous, I have an infinite number of, of positions. And uh, I'm interested in reducing uh, this set. If my, um, my data is integer, well, I can consider only integer points and it will give me a pseudo polynomial number of, of positions. So I can, it's a way, uh, first way to reduce the positions, but there are other methods and uh, this is what uh, I will be presenting. So the first way is, is due to uh, Ertz and uh, Christofides and Whitlock. So they propose the normal patterns and the canonical dissection is the same name for the same uh, set of coordinates. Uh, and basically I'm placing every item in the bottom left position, meaning that every item its left border has to touch the right border of another item or the left border of the bin. And we can compute uh, these uh, feasible position easily by uh, dynamic programming. And uh, we just have basically to generate all the possible set of widths, making sure that every possible set of width uh, respect the capacity of the dimension and it's doable by uh, dynamic programming. And for every uh, sum of widths, well, it will define me a coordinate. 
And then I will have a variable XID uh, identific uh, identifying if item I is placed in position D. So we'll have a variable for every item and for every position. And in the worst case, uh, I will have this pseudo polynomial number of variable. So it can go quite large for uh, some instances. And here I just have a small example with four items and uh, this of capacity. And it would give me 23 variables. So the normal pattern gives me uh, 23. And I'm interested in ways I can reduce uh, this uh, number of variables. So one way uh, to build the uh, normal patterns is uh, the following. So I will start with um, an empty bin and the uh, coordinate zero. And I will take an item and I will place it in coordinate zero. And its right corner will give me a new uh, placement position. I will remove it, I will consider another item and I will place it in every positions that I have. So I will place it here and here. And it, its right corner will give me a new placement position. So I will have these two new. And I will do that for all my items, placing them in the set of positions that I have. And this set will grow as I consider more items. And when I'm done, I will have this set of positions. And here you can see that uh, it is a bit uh, fewer position than considering only the integer position. Um, but still gives me a lot of positions, uh, very few uh, less than the, the integer positions. So I can reduce that further uh, using uh, what uh, Boschetti proposed in 2002. And the idea is that I will build my set of positions for every item. And I can simply build the set for item i, excluding i itself in the sum of widths. This will uh, increase the complexity of computing the position. It will be now be in uh, O of n square w. But I can reduce uh, my number of variable uh, by five uh, uh, in, in this example. For the meet in the middle, I will uh, consider an additional um, way to represent my solutions. So here, uh, imagine I will draw a line on the x-axis, T1. And every item that is positioned with this left corner on the left side of T1 will be left aligned, as usual. And if I... Uh, put the, the left corner on the right hand side, it will be right aligned, meaning that its right border has to touch the right border of the bin or the left border of another item. So uh, with this way of representing solution, I will still have the worst case as the other, but in most cases, we will see a drastic reduction. And I can compute these positions uh, like the normal pattern or like the Boschetti uh, et al patterns. Simply, I will take a cutting point, my vertical line, and everything that will be on the left side, um, I will compute all the sum of widths that can be on the left side. And I will compute all the sum of width that can be on the right side. Doing the union of both sets, will give me the whole set of uh, position for an item and doing the union for everything will give me the, union, the set of all position for all my items. So doing this for uh, my example will give me uh, 15 variables. So I'm reducing by three. And uh, one problem is that uh, different cutting point will give me different set of positions. So in my small example here, I add eight and it gives me 15. Um, if I cut in two, I will have 18. So like the normal pattern, if I cut in uh, four, 16, in six, 17. So you, you can see that the reduction is not uh, non-decreasing. Sometimes it go uh, higher. Uh, in eight, I reach the minimum. And if I cut a bit later, uh, it will increase. So I'm, I'm interested in finding the cutting point that will minimize my number of variables. 
And this is doable by dynamic program. Uh, I'm not showing that today. I'm also proposing three uh, pre-processing methods to reduce further this uh, number of variables. The first one is to fix the item of minimal width into the largest portion of the bin. So here the item in red is the smallest item and the right portion of the bin is the largest one. So we'll fix this red item in the right portion. So it means it, it won't be in any patterns that can be in the left-hand side. So when I will generate the pattern for this, I can exclude you saw my formula here, I'm ex, uh, for I, I'm excluding I. I will also exclude this item inside the, this set. So I can reduce further these, uh, these, these positions. Another one uh, that can be used to strengthen formulation is to uh, look inside uh, the patterns that we obtain. And in, in sometimes we can see that there will be an area where no item will be packed like here, there's, there's no item that can be packed here. So what I can do is I can simply enlarge uh, these two items. So they, they will become a bit larger. If I do that for, um, uh, if, if I consider the now these strengthen uh, positions for uh, an item. So let's see, I have this item in yellow that I can place here and that I can place here. So consider that this part, uh, there's nothing that can be packed here. So I will enlarge uh, the item in yellow. And then any solution where, uh, where the item that, that is now red here is placed here uh, can be transformed into a solution where it is placed here. Uh, not showing the proof, you have to believe me. Uh, so this is kind of a symmetric solution. And basically this one will dominate the other one. So I can eliminate this position. Uh, so this was a three, uh, three method to uh, reduce further a set of positions. Uh, so here I'm showing an example of the reduction we can obtain on a classical uh, 2D uh, packing problem in GK08 with 20 item and a bin width of 40. Uh, so here you can see that the meat in the middle, depending on the cutting point you're choosing, uh, you will have a different uh, number of uh, positions. And it is uh, non-decreasing. So you can see like sometimes it, it goes higher. And then when you reach a certain cutting point, it, it increase. Uh, if you apply the first preprocessing by fixing the smallest item, you can see uh, an important reduction. So we add around maybe 25% here at the minimum and here we can reach lower than uh, 50%. Uh, applying only the last preprocessing, you can reduce that further. And applying both, uh, you get the best, uh, you get uh, at least 50% almost every time. I will test uh, these uh, meet in the middle on different uh, problems, formulations. Um, I would just do the, the Bing packing problem and the to the orthogonal packing problem. So uh, I will consider the arc flow formulation of uh, Valerio de Caravaggio 99. And I will also consider the 2D orthogonal packing of uh, myself, uh, Dynamico and uh, Iori. So my setup is the following. It was coded in C++ using uh, Cplex. Um, I'm using the default uh, setting of Cplex. I ran all my models for 20 minutes and I will test three configuration, the classical model, uh, maybe the normal position, the normal patterns or the, the model that was defined in the paper. Uh, then I will consider the MIM and the MIM with the preprocessing. So for the bin packing, uh, there are a lot of data sets. Uh, I did not consider uh, all of them. Uh, the other ones are sometimes uh, harder. So um, this method uh, is not uh, very computationally good on, on these. Um, so for the arc flow, the classical method, uh, you can see the size of the graph that is uh, generated. So on some instances, it can grow, grow quite large. So like on short tree, it can grow to uh, more than 1 million uh, arcs. 
And applying the MIM on uh, these instances, you can see the average reduction in number of arcs and average reduction in number of nodes that we obtain. So uh, for Shoal tree, uh, we can get a reduction of 97% in number of arcs. So basically our model have maybe 30,000 arcs instead of uh, 1 million, uh, 500,000. And applying the preprocessing, you uh, get an additional reduction in number of arcs and, and variables. Uh, when we uh, put that in CPLEX, uh, so uh, with the classical arc flow, there is uh, 72 instances that we cannot solve over um, 1,600. And with the meet in the middle, we can solve an additional uh, 37. And we can also solve all the short tree instances here uh, that could not be solved with the classical method. And with the preprocessing, we can solve an additional two instances, but the, the number, the, like the improvement is not so big. Uh, we'll skip this one. So on the 2D orthogonal packing problems, I will be using a mixed integer formulation that Manuel presented Monday. And I will use the positions that were proposed by Boschetti et al. It's kind of the normal pattern. Uh, meet in the middle and the meet in the middle with the preprocessing. So on these uh, different data sets, um, the classical methods can solve 100, uh, cannot solve 101 instances. With the meet in the middle, we can solve uh, 25 more instances and with the preprocessing, uh, two more instances. You can see that the reduction in number of variable is not as high as in the, the arc flow. Um, basically it's because the instance are made uh, differently. And with the arc flow, uh, we have additional pre-processing that I did not present. And uh, I think that's it. So thank you uh, for attending the talk. Uh, I presented a new way to reduce the number of variable in index-based formulation. And uh, for the future, uh, I would like to apply this principle to other problems and maybe uh, think of other methods to solve this problem, like by uh, designing a new branching scheme or uh, designing new formulation, uh, including this principle. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jean-François. Um, questions? Um, I can see. Yeah, Florian? Uh, yes, so thank you for the presentation. Uh, this model is very interesting. Um, I just uh, have a question about the last uh, table. Uh, it seemed that with the pre-processing, uh, um, sometimes it solves less instances or... Uh, uh, it is a typical behavior of MIPS. Um, I think it's a bit random. There, there's one fact is that these guys are random. Uh, so I can give two me the same mid, but I change the, the constraints and it will give me uh, like the order of the constraint. It will, it will give me a different answer, a different computation time. And uh, maybe another explanation is that uh, because I'm reducing the possible solutions uh, sometimes the heuristic of CPLEX cannot find the, the solutions. And it happens often on the bin packing problem because the, the, the bound is, is very good. So uh, it, it finds the, the, well, the, the value of the lower bound is the same as the optimal, but it cannot find the solution. And sometimes on uh, some instances, uh, the heuristic is just not able to find the, the optimal solution. And um, can so also... in this case, do you have an idea of um, how many instances you don't solve but just because of uh, the primal value? Uh, on this problem that I did, did not present, 
there there are not many uh, maybe like for each data for each uh, type of problem maybe uh, three to four problems that uh, i have this okay thank you uh, there, we have... there, are, there are two questions yeah. in the in the yeah. chat okay yeah i saw yeah uh, mauro, mauro Russo is asking me if you have any comment about the comparison with your uh after points uh uh in my paper i do that um, okay the 2018 uh, paper in, in yes forms? yes okay. uh i do that um the meet in the middle with the pre-processing uh get the best uh, number of uh, positions uh, the raster reduced raster points are, are very good as well and we also have another question if you have some uh, comparison between this approach and then reflect and i would like to add something i would think about uh, applying this approach to the reflect formulation so uh, it's two questions the first question is can you compare this approach in the original workflow with the reflect uh, the meet in the middle is applicable to uh, any type of uh, packing problems. So 1D, 2D, or 3D. Uh, reflect is only for the, the bin packing. It's only uh, in 1D. And uh, the meet in the middle, uh, they don't do as well as reflect. Reflect is better. Uh, but on some problems, reflect is not, uh, is not very good. On uh, variable bin packing problems, um, uh, tomorrow, one of my students uh, will present uh, something for the multi knapsack, and we try with reflect, and it generates uh, so many uh, arcs uh, compared with the classical uh, method that uh, we barely not use it. Okay. So a good approach would be to apply the meter in the middle, meet in the middle, in the reflect formulation. Oh, I don't, I don't think uh, it can be done. Don't, don't you think it's work? No, because reflect is like they, they cut the bean in, in two. Okay. And then uh, it's like a it's kind of a sandwich, like they cut, like they, 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 they take the bean and then they yeah, flip it yeah. uh, over itself. Um, yeah. I that don't was my question. So you think it's not possible to, up, to, no. to apply? No. Okay. Okay, thanks. Are there, again. there are no other questions? I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, let's go to our next speaker. That is Rim. Yes. Yes, Rim. Can you share your screen now? <laughs> yeah, I hope. <laughs> uh, yeah. Is it shared? Yeah. Okay. Now. Click the full screen. Hi, nice to see everybody, even though virtually, unfortunately. This is some work that I have done with uh, Sergei Polyagovsky from uh, Deakin University. Uh, my talk will just go through the usual introduction, the presentation of the models, the math heuristics, some results and conclusions. Uh, usually, whenever we are producing a file cabinet, then we have to produce, for example, all its items. We don't have to cut them all from the same wood pallets. We can use different uh, wood pallet sizes. Uh, another example that ties to the first tutorial of today would be the shipping. So for example, I just received my uh, laptop and its different parts were shipped in different boxes and some of them uh, had plenty of waste that I have to get rid of and styrofoam, which are kind of uh, nasty to the environment. So the idea is that we do not want these wasted areas and we would like to use the bins that best fit uh, the problem, uh, that best fit the items that we are going to use. Uh, the problem I'll be talking about today is the unweighted oriented guillotine variable size to dimensional bin packing, a lot of wording there. So let's understand what's happening. We are going to consider that we have a set of M different types of bins. Each one of them is characterized by its length and its width. And the cost of this bin is proportional to, or is at least its area. We are going to have, so that will give me the variable size to dimensional. Then we are talking about, uh, and it also gives me the unweighted since the cost is simply the area. 
Then we have a set of N items. Each one of these items is characterized by its width and height, and these items cannot be rotated. So that's why we have the oriented case. And at the end, we have what we call the guillotine. Okay, and what we mean by guillotine is that we would like the cut, uh, the way to generate the items to be either using vertical cuts or using horizontal cuts. Of course, we talk about the feasible uh, packing because we do not want the items to overlap and we want the items to be totally contained within their containers. Uh, this problem is, of course, uh, academically challenging because its one-dimensional uh, case is strongly NP-hard. It also appears as a variant to many other problems in scheduling in cutting. For example, the glass cutting problem that was presented by Ramon yesterday or the day before is uh, a special case of the variable size two-dimensional bin packing. We have a lot of industrial cases and they are all basically known. Uh, because be, the bin packing is difficult, uh, mainly because the approximate approaches have to deal with the highly symmetric nature of the problem. For those reasons, we are using a math heuristic, but we are going to make our math heuristic a little bit intelligent, and we are going to explore the advances in technologies, the uh, advances in uh, solvers, especially in CPLEX. So we are going to make our math heuristic use a sequence of uh, mixed integer programs. Now, what these mixed integer programs are going to do is that they are going to reserve space for unpacked items. So they are not just going to, uh, they are going to kind of divide the problem into small pieces and bits. And at each iteration, they are going to pack some of these items, but also reserve some space for unpacked items. They are going to be guided by dual feasibility functions uh, constraints, as uh, discussed by Iori on the first tutorial of the ACCAP meeting. And then we are going to also augment the models by upper bounds on the values of the objective function, so to constrain the advancement into improving directions only. We are going to dot these MIPs with uh, look-ahead mechanisms. So these look-ahead mechanisms, as I said, they constrain the search to improving directions and they prohibit the investigation of infeasible directions. Uh, the nicest thing about our model is that it's going to avoid dealing with the geometrical constraints and it's going to use the notion of regions. So this goes in line to the work that Jose and uh, Silva presented yesterday, even though independently from what we have done. So we, we consider a region, or it could be a bin, which has a given length and a given uh, width. Then whenever we pack an item, then we have to make a decision on whether the cut has to be a horizontal cut, or what we call an alpha cut, or a vertical one. Whenever we do that, we automatically determine two new regions, which are going to be one to the right, okay, and one which is on top. So the minute we determine the type of cut, we are also determining these two regions. So all the packing for us is going to be in these regions, whether the region is going to be a bin or uh, the residue of a bin. Okay. We are going to use in our mixed integer programs three types of variables. The first variable is xik, which assigns an item to a bin. Then we have yik, which is going to reserve free space in future iterations. And we are going to have ei, which is the items that remain unassigned during an iteration. After that, we are going to have positive variables that are going to estimate the number of bins that we will need in future iterations for a given type of bins. Okay, and we are going to have the binary variables, which are going to determine the type of the cut. And these regions, whether the regions that we are going to obtain are going to be these two or these two. Now, just to give you an example, suppose that we have eight items that we are going to pack into three bin types. So, and suppose that this is the solution. 
So in this case, what we did, of course, before we start, we have to do also some pre-processing to determine the set of items that fit into each bin so that we don't have any, uh, over, uh, any uh, not overlap, but uh, any items that are assigned to a bin that doesn't fit them. So for example, here, we are going to have that X3, one, this is the bin type is going to be equal to one. We are going to have X8, two is equal to one because we have item eight that has been assigned to a bin of type two. And we are going to have X5, three, okay, equals to one. But on the other hand, because we can only assign one item to each region, we are going to have these two uh, items that have been reserved some space. Okay, so we just give them uh, their y variables equal to one. Of course, to be able to get this back in, we had to determine that here we have a vertical uh, cut and we have a set of items that haven't yet been packed. Now for the next iteration of the MIP, what's going to happen is that these three items haven't already been packed. These three items can fit, the first two items can fit here but the other three can fit either here or here. So we are going to have, again, three bin types, but we are also going to have the right part of this bin, and we are going to have the top part of this bin, which are going to be new regions that we have. Now for this small bin in which item three has been packed, I'm not going to have any residual part. So here I don't have any new additional areas. And for uh, the bin type two, in which I have packed item eight, I'm going to have this strip, but this strip is not usable. I cannot put any item into it. So this is what we are really doing is that uh, the nice thing about this is that we can assign many items to uh, at the same time. And we are dealing with several regions at the same time. So we are not doing a bottom left heuristic or a sequential heuristic as most approaches do. Now we have, of course, assignment uh, in our MIPs. We are going to have assignment constraints that limit the position of every item to a single region. We are going to have look ahead constraints that are going to reserve some space for the items. Then we are going to have an upper bound on the area of the new bins that we are going to have in the future. We don't want it to exceed. And here we are subtracting one because all of these numbers are integer. So in order to have strictly less. We are also going to have those constraints that are going to determine the regions that, are going, that we are going to do and implicitly their, uh, their dimensions depending on the cut that we are going to have, whether it's vertical or horizontal. And then we are going to have the dual feasibility functions constraints that I already talked about on the tutorial. We have three different models. Each one of them has a different objective function, but they all, of course, uh, the aim of the three models is to try to find a feasible packing. So the first one is going to maximize the net profit of the items. So it takes the profit of the assigned items and subtracts the cost of the non-assigned items. The second model is used for whenever we fail to find a good pack, a feasible packing. And this is going to obtain high quality solutions at a cost of uh, additional computer, uh, computational time. And the third uh, mixed integer program also will have the same constraints, but a different objective function. And this one uh, allows us to find what we call hidden solutions, solutions that are difficult to obtain usually or back in patterns that are difficult to obtain because the number of bins is small and we cannot add additional bins because that would increase the, the, the cost or that will, go, that will take us into infeasibility. Our math heuristic is uh, an iterative one. Uh, the iterative uh, part is kind of classical where you start by, in, by an empty pattern with all the items being unpacked and your upper bound being uh, infinite, then we apply a search procedure. If the search procedure improves the upper bound, then we update the upper bound and the solution. And as long as the runtime is not exceeded, then we just reiterate. 
Now, our search procedure is uh, what is really interesting because what this search procedure does is that it calls one uh, the packing, which is done by one of the MIPs. We have the, our first model is the basics one. If the first model is successful, then uh, we update things. Uh, we also decrement the counter of number of infeasible uh, solutions we obtained, and we update our set of dense packings. Okay, what we do here is that we apply a diversification stage, which is based on a sequential value correction mechanism to update our pseudocasts and to allow us to obtain other solutions. Now, if we are not successful, we just go and check our iteration counter. If we had, uh, if we have, if we did not have uh, too many, uh, if we did not exceed our iterations, we look at the number of failures that we had. If we had too many failures, then we go ahead and change our uh, objective function in order to be able to find either good quality pattern or to find some hidden solutions that we haven't been able to to obtain so far, and then go back to Okay, in these two cases, we go back and we reiterate our packing procedure. In case uh, we have already exceeded the number of iterations, then we apply an intensification step, which takes uh, the dense uh, bins. It considers them one by one. It locks uh, one dense bin along with its items, and then uh, solves a reduced problem again it repeats all these steps, but with fewer items and one less bin. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go into the uh, sequential uh, value correction mechanism, but it it works almost as uh, the updating of the hormone in ant colony, where you inherit some information from previous patterns, and uh, you use the last information that you have. So you have two different updating mechanisms depending on whether you have uh, the item has been packed in the last iteration or not. Uh, in terms of results, we have run our uh, math heuristic. Uh, we have implemented it in C sharp. We have run it on a PC with 16 gigabyte of RAM. And we tested it on the benchmark of Pissinger and uh, Sigurd, which has 10 classes, five problem sizes, and uh, 10 problem instances, uh, 10 instances per problem type. And we compared the results to the simulated annealing based heuristic of Hong and to the bounds that were uh, given by our Italian friends. So he, whoops, that's too huh? So whenever we compare our utilization, the utilization is the area of the items divided by the area of the bins that have been used. So here you have the simulated annealing of Hong et al. Uh, we have only Hong and uh, Shalom Bus who have uh, results for the variable sized two dimensional bin backing with guillotine uh, cats. So the best results are the ones that we are using. So here we have 87% as the utilization compared to our utilization of 89.26% when uh, for equal run times. Whenever we increase the, our run time to 10 minutes, then we can slightly improve the results. We, imp we match 160 uh, results of uh, Hong et al. and we improve 294. Uh, results. If you, these improvements, if we look at them, here we are looking at the ratio of their utilization, uh, of our utilization to that of uh, Hong. We'll find that we are not doing well for class two and class four. These are classes where uh, we use very few uh, bins. So if we don't write, if we don't hit the right uh, bin, then uh, our result will be worse. Okay. Uh, the same thing is observed even when we increase the runtime, our runtime, and this is a comparison of our approach whenever we use 10 minutes versus only one minute, and uh, we do get some improvement when we uh, allow the runtime to be increased. 
Now, uh, for class two and class four, this is really independent of the problem size. So even uh, for, you know, uh, we are not doing as well for problem two and four. Again, because as soon as we miss the, the right bin, we, we lose. Now, we also run it for uh, identical bin sizes. If my memory is, is correct, Iori was saying that he proved the optimality of 470 of those instances that are available in the literature. We proved the optimality of 415, hitting uh, with our solution having exactly the same number of bins as those that are reported in the literature for the lower bound of these bins. We match uh, 72. And I guess for the 30 that they did not uh, prove optimal, we have been able to improve 13 of those. We have been able to improve the, the existing solutions for 13 uh, of the available uh, ones. So in conclusion, we have, the, we have provided a math heuristic that uh, diversifies its search using three different mixed integer programs. Okay. And uh, we are dotting them with uh, look-ahead mechanisms that are based on DFFs and on no good cuts. So this makes our uh, mixed integer programs focus on the most productive part of the search space. Uh, the approach is innovative in the way we model the problem because we do not look at the geometrical aspects at all. And we, I think the main uh, contribution is that we do a many items to many bins assignments at the same time, while existing heuristics deal with one item at a time. And we do uh, outperform the state of the art by improving 294 solutions. And we provide a general framework, even though we have applied this to the variable sized bin packing, uh, the same idea of the geometrical uh, over uh, riding the geometrical aspects has been treated yesterday by uh, Oliveira and Silva. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Really? Thank yeah. you for having me and thank you for seeing everybody. Questions? Again. questions? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, there is a, a question in the chat. Uh, is, is it a published research? Have you published it? Uh, no, we, no, not yet. Uh, it has been submitted. Yeah, but uh, yeah. This, some of the ideas, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, you, you, you go ahead, please. Now, I was saying that uh, some of the ideas are similar to what have been uh, presented here. So it seems that everybody's working on the same line of research these days. So that's all of them, yeah. I think Antonio has a question. Yes. Well, thank you, Rim, for the presentation. It was really a good presentation. Um, I, was, I was thinking on the, on the um, on the linear relaxation that you might get on your model, because of the, um, the if if I understand correctly, the epsilon variables they actually allow not to pack all the pieces, no? Yes. And uh, are those quite uh, fractional, or are, are you keeping an eye on those on those uh, variables? Since perhaps branching on those variables first, putting more priorities might might actually help on those. The question is, if the, are those variables fractional on the, re, on, the, on the linear relaxation? No. Uh, I, I, did, I don't know. Yeah, don't know. Do you know, Sergey? Say? Uh, I'm asking my co-author. Hi. I don't know as well. So we just got a meet Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah, so it just took a couple of uh, milliseconds generally for every model. So uh, we didn't check, can we? So the question if we can solve this ah, okay. linear programming. So uh, MIPS are very quick, so just uh, milliseconds generally. And, ah, okay, so I miss, I perhaps missed that. So how many variables then you, you more or less roughly, you, you, how many rows and columns do you have in each model that you are solving, do you know that? Uh, we didn't really care about that because again, it was so quick. <laughs> so we yeah. had no issues Fair with the yeah. runtime. Yes, but uh, normally uh, uh, not that many. So we do uh, 
um, like gradual introduction of uh, new variables and new regions and so on. So we keep uh, problem size constrained. And as you see, we also use intensification step like uh, fixing the most dense beans and trying to recursively solve with the same algorithm those parts of um, in terms of solution space that are more profitable for us. So that's the main driver for our approach in this case. And it's all together with uh, this look ahead with the dual feasible constraints. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it drives very well. So it limits very, very quickly at the SH. Right, thank yeah. you. Yeah, the sizes of the problems that we are solving at every iteration are very small because we are not, we are adding only one bin type, uh, not one bin type, one bin per type, in addition to all the regions that we are inheriting and we are removing all the regions that do not fit items. And also for the items, we only send them to regions where they can be packed. So I think that limits the, uh, the number of variables. But that's a yes. good point. We didn't uh, look at that. OK, anyway, thank you. Thank look you at the linear much. relaxation. Thank you. OK, that's a good thank idea. you. I think can now we need to finish it. OK, thank you all. Uh, Julia, what shall we do now? Third five? <laughs> should, should we take, take five, five minutes? Can we? Five minutes? Five minutes, is that all right for everybody? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
The popular additive monocuvectoring approach implies inserting the geometry, so-called uh, supports at the pre-manufacturing stage. This support then can be removed, thus increasing the duration and cost of production. The support-free technology, called lightweight and support-free, are free from these disadvantages. However, the part generated this uh, technology design has sharp changes or angles in the shape. They present the stress concentrators that cause local increases in mechanical stress. We propose alternative approach to design the support for structures, including the production by 3D printing. The approach deals with cylindrical holes integration in the material free spaces of the parts. We discuss here a new problem of the optimal packing ellipses that takes into account special technical requirements for 3D printing, using minimal wall thickness, minimum and maximum radius of cavity on the internal surfaces. And now let us come down to the problem formulation. So we have the disconnected region with polygonal convex components and denoted by PQ and the disconnected region by a omega. And we have also the family of ellipses, which have variable sizes, same axis, and uh, translation vector and rotation parameters. So for each ellipse, we have one, two, three, four, five variables. And the, the metrical characteristics of these ellipses uh, has some limits, uh, which is uh, motivated by the 3D standards of 3D printing. And uh, uh, the problem from creation of the ellipse packing problem in a disconnected polygon domain can be presented as follows. Find side ellipse subsets that can be fully arranged within the appropriate convex polygons with the maximum occupied area taking into account the given minimum allowable distance between the ellipses. The problem is equivalent to a sequence of n independent packing subproblems in the following formulation n uppercase of n, it means the number of convex polygon in our disconnected area. We need to find the number of ellipses, the placement parameters, and uh, the sizes of ellipses. They are packed in a convex polygon taking into account distance constraint, such that the packing factor will reach its maximum value. Uh, this ellipse packing problem in a convex polygon, ELC, uh, is the following uh, placement constraints. First, containment constraints, so each ellipse must belongs to the a convex polygon, then distance constraints between two each, uh, two each pair of ellipses. I mean, Euclidean distance between two ellipses. And uh, as usual, to describe the containment and distance constraints, we use uh, the Wi-Fi function technique and uh, uh, you know that there's a um, continuous and every defined functions and this function in the positive mode serve two purpose, keeping objects apart and keeping objects in a target container. And uh, for this particular problem, uh, we define the functions that describe by functions that describe containment ellipse into disconnected region 
polygonal region and uh, uh, for containment ellipse into convex polygon uh, using special uh, classes of five functions. And uh, we say that non-negative values of this function implies a containment constraint. And also uh, we construct uh, the so-called normalized quasi-five functions to describe non-overlapping ellipses. We say quasi-five function because this function depends not only placement parameters and metrical characteristic of objects and also for some additional uh, variable, which is some special angle between the axis OX and the line which is perpendicular to the separated line between two ellipses. And uh, this quasi five function uh, uh, helps us to describe the distance constraint between, global distance constraint between two ellipses. Uh, based on the five functions and quasi five functions, we can present the mathematical model of layout of ellipses in disconnected region as a mixed integer problem, which involve uh, continuous variables for each pair of ellipses and also um, a zero one variable that uh, define whether ellipse inside the region or not. Uh, this problem, packing ellipses in disconnected region, can be is equivalent to n independent problems to pack ellipses in a convex polygon. And uh, uh, also the mathematical model of this sub problem can be presented as a mixed integer problem as well. And in turn, each of this problem is equivalent to NQ independent nonlinear programming problem for faking variable number of ellipses from one to NQ. And each of these nonlinear programming problem can be described by the nodal uh, and this model involves only continuous variables uh, where it allows us to, to define the number of ellipses, the metrical characteristics of ellipses, placement parameters involving translation vectors and rotation parameters for each of convex subregion. To solve this problem, we I propose we develop some algorithm that based on the solution uh, of each step, the solution of the problem in a convex polygon, and which is uh, reduced to solving T problems of nonlinear programming using uh, IP opt as the NLP solver, uh, which is currently our the good. Uh, <coughs> A local optimal solution. And for this, uh, the latest problem, we use a solution strategy. First stage is generate the number of visible starting point, then search for the local maximum of this point and choose the best local maximum for those found at stage two. And the, the most interesting part of my talk is the computational results. <laughs> Uh, with application. We apply our algorithm to design a geometry part for the support for 3D printing. And this geometry is a result of topological optimization applied for this 3D part, which is rigidly fixed in its end and loaded in the lower part of the opposite side. And uh, one of the best much a solution of the problem is a part investigated in this paper. And this design scheme is quite common when testing your algorithm. And uh, uh, if we apply the direct 3D printing of the given part using 
uh, leads to unexpected printing results. And to exclude these such case, cases, uh, support and support free models have been designed. And uh, now in this picture, you can see the stress state of the parts uh, made of aluminum powder material and uh, uses the, the point of maximum stress for each of these uh, design parts. And uh, in this picture, you can see the manufacturing parts with traditional structures. You have some unexpected results, I uh, mentioned above. And we and we do we apply our algorithm and present uh, <clears throat> alternative geometry. And now I remind you that let, let we have area which involve five convex polygons. And that is the result of our computational results with elliptical holes and round holes. And uh, now analysis of the stress state of the obtained part shows that the maximum uh, mechanical strength for ellipse holes is 13 and 4 and for round uh, 16 and 5 in comparison with previous you can see it's con con considerably smaller. So therefore, uh, the suggested algorithm for preparing part geometry is not sensitive to printing direction, maybe vertically or horizontally. Therefore, it is parts printed in the printer in the um, Hanover uh, University. And uh, now we can conclude that the proposed approach allows obtaining part with the optimized topology, which is ready to use for direct and manufacturing using the technology of the support free 3D printing and advantages of our approach. It is not sensitive to the direction of 3D printing, does not have stress concentrators in comparison with alternative approaches and does not require post-processing. The developed program automatically creates designing parts according to the criteria of both static and static strengths. And uh, thank you for your kind attention. Any questions, please? Any questions? I think uh, Tony has his hands up, Tatiana. Ah, okay. Antonia, please. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, thank you for the for the presentation. Very nice, very nice work indeed. So um, I was wondering why you why you are using quasi phi functions. So what's the reason of using quasi phi functions instead of the normal phi functions? Is because of deficiency in modeling, or is because of the you cannot just model that problem with using the the original the the real functions? Uh, thank you for a question. And we use uh, the new class of phi function, which is called quasi phi function, when we cannot. De uh, describe analytically the relationship between sub some shapes like ellipses or which uh, can uh, continuously rotate it because we try to 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 construct a uh, five function but it's in it is very mm, complicated expression like and um, maybe uh, minimum uh, four power Okay, x four power f six power equations, and uh, and a huge number of tri um, uh, and ge ge geometry calculations additional. So, but if we add just one variable, uh, uh, except the placement parameters, uh, using a separated line. And each separated line, you know, uh, maybe uh, uh, has some variables, okay? And so if we have, if two ellipses do not overlap, if it's 
uh, each one of these do not overlap with semi uh, semi plane mm -hmm. from one thing. And another, the second ellipse, uh, do not overlap with this, uh, with the second plane, okay, opposite. So we say, uh, do not, uh, do two ellipses do not overlap if there exists at least one separated line. And the main thing, uh, the connection between the phi function and quasi phi function, the maximum of quasi phi function by additional variable is a phi function. So, uh, we have advantages that we can simply uh, um, we can solve uh, uh, the we can reduce uh, our problems uh, with uh, um, with arbitrary shape uh, objects in two dimensional and three dimensional space. Uh, it is advantages of quasi phi function and the disadvantages that additional variables. Okay, but for ellipse is just one additional variable. Okay, so therefore, to solve uh, such kind of problem, it takes for one run uh, eight second. Okay, so to solve this problem, uh, we use uh, one hundred runs, and uh, and it, it means uh, eight hundred seconds. Okay, and but uh, in in. The same way now we solve two dimensional and not only two dimensional but three dimensional also some with ellipsoids and more complicated shapes so like sphere sphere cylinders and the, some composed objects and so on. The, therefore, we and also to to take into account distance constraints, we use different classes of quasi phi function like adjust phi quasi phi function and so on. But but the main scene, the difference between phi function and quasi phi function, that we use quasi phi function if we would like to simplify the non overlapping constraints for different shapes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any questions? And uh, and I would like to add that we now. Uh, on the way uh, in our investigation to to void the uh, some void structures to generate void structures in three dimensional uh, domains, okay? Because it's very important for three D printing. Okay, and now we have no time uh, for my question <laughs> for questions to me, and uh, because we have time limits, and uh, the next. Uh, uh, the, the next speak, speaker is Jonas, uh, and uh, from Catholic University of Leuven, Belgium. Uh, and uh, his talk is a uh, recasting approach for collision detection in 3D or regular cutting and packing problems. Please, you have 18 minutes. Yeah, thank you, Tatiana, for the introduction. So yes, my name is uh, Jonas Tollenaere. I'm a PhD student under the supervision of uh, Tony Waters at the uh, KU Leuven University. And today I'm going to present some of the work I've been doing in the past couple of months. So um, the problems we are dealing with uh, are the extraction of maximal items from a solid 3D material, where we want to maximize either the volume or the value that these items have, and this can be one or more items. We want to consider the most general case where the items can be irregular shapes and non-convex. And to represent these objects, we use uh, triangular meshes, as you can see in the image on the right. Um, these problems have applications in stone cutting and gem cutting, but also arise in the, the context of 3D printing, if you want to maximize the shape. Um, I first want to mention some of the work of one of my colleagues, Everton Fernandez Silva. He explored the possibility of solving these kind of problems for single items, and he used nonlinear programming formulations for the convex cases. And when the material was non-convex, he uh, resorted to metaheuristics and mixed integer linear programming. Um, this paper was accepted for publication in computers and operations research, and uh, yeah, it will be pub published in the future. 
Um, but what's important for us here is that these approaches are not really reasonable when we are dealing when we deal with a larger instances from the real world. Um, in that case, we have to resort to meta heuristics like uh, late acceptance of or uh, simulated annealing to find decent solutions. And these algorithms typically um, evaluate different solutions in an iterative manner. So we want to test new positions, rotations, or scalings one after the other. And for every iteration, we have to test if a solution is feasible. And a solution that is feasible means that the items cannot overlap each other. So the triangular meshes that represent these objects can't intersect each other. And the items can also not intersect the material because that would mean that some of the item would lie outside the material. And our performance of these meta heuristics is ultimately bottlenecked by uh, these geometric computations because um, they take quite a long time. Traditionally, we would uh, search for an intersection by trying to find a pair of triangles that intersect each other. There has already been a, a lot of research on this topic on how we can make this fast. And typically we would use um, some data structures like bounding volume hierarchies to speed up our search. And these structures divide the space into uh, different areas and these subdivisions have to be searched separately and that way we can uh, speed up our search. But today we are going to focus on another um, approach. Um, our main research question here originated from the fact that the uh, recent graphical processor architectures feature hardware accelerated ray tracing. This means that these uh, GPU chips contain specialized ray tracing cores that can be used to um, track rays in, inside a scene with objects and to calculate if they intersect with any of the triangles of the objects. And these, these RT cores can do this very fast. Um, they can do it in the order of magnitude of giga rays per second. So that is a 10 to the ninth rays per second. And while this is typically used for graphical processing, this is actually a, an, an enormous amount of geometric computation power. And we wonder if we can use this for to test for intersections and conclude if our solutions are feasible or not. Um, and of course, it's possible to do this. Otherwise, I wouldn't be giving this uh, this presentation. Um, the starting point of our approach is actually quite simple. Uh, it is based on the fact that for two intersecting triangles, there are always two edges from one of the triangles that intersects uh, the other triangle. You can see these examples here where we have um, two intersecting edges for uh, each intersecting intersection. So we can actually replace a, a triangle triangle intersection test by a, a test that tests if a ray intersects a triangle. And because we know there are always two edges, we can actually test only five out of the six edges. The next step is to recognize that we can actually um, uh, recognize that there is, is in fact a, a ray triangle test where um, the edges of the, the triangles are short rays with their origin in one of the vertices and the directions according to the direction of the edge. Um, and this is very interesting because we are uh, working towards the uh, kind of operations that these ray tracing cores can execute. But of course, we want to extend our methodology to the intersection of all triangle meshes. But this is no problem. We can just um, trace all the rays of one uh, object to through the triangle of the other object, and also the other way around from the other object into the first object. And if we find one of these rays that intersects, we can co conclude that these objects intersect and that the solution is not feasible. Um, and these are exactly the operations that these ray tracing cores can execute. Um, they will have a scene of objects represented by triangular meshes, and you can submit a batch of rays, and you will call the right programs to see if they intersect or not. 
Um, and finally, we can also reduce the number of rays because um, we know that there are always two intersecting edges per triangle pair. So for one of the objects over seen, we can reduce the rays um, like shown in this picture. Typically, we would do this for the largest mesh because then we have the highest reduction in our workloads. But uh, sometimes it's interesting to uh, take an item that intersects with a lot of objects, so you have less work to calculate. Um, we implemented this methodology in uh, the NVIDIA Optics library. This is a library from NVIDIA that allows us to create a ray tracing pipeline and write all the programs that are called when rays uh, will miss or when they hit anything. And we use this, for example, in the closest hit program to set a, a feasible flag to infeasible um, to keep track of our uh, progress. Um, in order to test our approach, we uh, created a data set with objects that vary in complexity from very small meshes like this star on the left to um, extremely large objects with uh, hundreds of thousands of triangles uh, so that we have a varying uh, data set to test our, our approach in, in different situations. Here we have the results of a first benchmark where we um, run a late acceptance algorithm uh, on instances where we have one item inside another item. And we did this for all combinations of objects from our data set using a Quadro RTX 4000 GPU. Um, on the horizontal axis, you can see the number of edges. Um, this is a degree of complexity for the solution. And on the vertical axis, you can see the amount of iterations per second that we managed to achieve. You will notice that there is a, a flat uh, kind of roof uh, on 25,000 iterations per second. Um, this happens because there is always some latency involved when calling the, the GPU. And we have uh, some operations we have to do for every iteration that takes some time. So that's why we, we can't really reach through this barrier of 25,000 um, iterations per second. But as the instances get more complex, so you can see that the, uh, the speed we achieve scales more according to the workload. But it actually scales really well as we have a, a logarithmic uh, curve on the, the horizontal axis and the iteration scale almost linearly. So that's very nice. Um, here we try to make a comparison with the traditional methods, but as you can see, it's not very easy to do that. It's not really fair to make a comparison between uh, CPU and GPU uh, computing in the first place. And the CPU approach has some advantages that we can exit functions when we find an intersection, while the GPU has to execute all running kernels before terminating. But you can see that for a lot of uh, situations, we actually get a really nice speed up, especially in the red zone uh, at the bottom of the graph. For these uh, instances, we easily get a speed up of factor 25 or more. And that's really good to uh, speed up our uh, meta heuristics running on top of this. Next, I also have some results for um, multiple item uh, instances, but uh, here it's the same trend as the, the single item instances, but there is a lot higher variance. Um, we didn't yet make a CPU comparison for these instances, but it will probably an even, be an even uh, bigger difference than in the previous uh, graph. So as I mentioned, this is still a bit of work in progress. Um, in the future, we want to make uh, better comparisons with the traditional approaches, both on CPU and GPU, because it will be more fair to compare two uh, programs running on GPU. And we also want to test our approach on the latest hardware because um, the next generation of uh, ray tracing course really promises uh, a better throughput. 
and we want to see if it scales well to uh, our uh, methods. So in the end, I can conclude that uh, we propose a new approach to collision detection, and we can leverage these uh, ray tracing capabilities of the graphical processors. As a result, we can uh, run our algorithms with the original objects, and we have no need for simplifications like voxelization or encapsulation in a convex shape. And this is a good foundation for our future work on uh, 3D irregular cutting and packing problems, as we can uh, quickly evaluate a lot of solutions. To finish, I'd like to show a small demonstration of uh, one of the algorithms on the instances. Here we have uh, an instance with more than 30,000 triangles per item, and we let uh, five different items optimize inside a, a larger container. And even though these are really complex shapes, we still manage to get about 7,000 iterations per second, which is really a good result according to us. So um, this was my presentation. Uh, we thank you too for your attention and also thank the organizers for this, uh, this event and the opportunity to speak here. Thank you, Jonas. Any question, please? Any questions? Please, Julia. Uh, thank you. That was a really, really interesting presentation. Um, my my question is, I, I understand your paper was around collision detection. Um, <laughs> But my question is um, whether you would be able to, to adapt these methods to be able to, to identify instances where you have um, one item contained completely within the other when you don't want it to be. So effectively, that's an infeasible um, um, configuration of the items. So we actually did, uh, uh, we added some text uh, for this. Um, I will try to show you because it was, uh, Added on a hidden slide. Can you see uh, this slide? Yeah. Okay, so we actually added some other rays um, to the bed um, that check if the item is really inside the other uh, the, the material. So we have a, an uh, infinite ray that eventually hits the back face of the material. And we do a similar kind of thing for checking if items are not inside each other, where we, um, yeah, the, the ray can hit other items, but it shouldn't hit it from uh, the inside. Mm -hmm. And the, the optics pipeline allows us to easily implement this. Thank you. Antonio, please. Antonio, please. Yeah. So thank you, Jonas, for the presentation. Very, very, very nice presentation. So um, I was, I was. Perhaps you said that, on, and I missed on the presentation. But uh, what are you deciding when you are packing those those objects? Are you deciding on? The, I can see that you are rotating and you are um, changing the dimensions of the well, the yeah, the you scale the the shape as well. So are yeah. So I guess those are the decisions. The, um, uh, the decisions that, that the algorithm is making. Yeah, the decisions we make is um, are the positions, rotations, and, and scaling of all the items. So, and are you and restricting? I can see a benefit of scaling a specific item a lot because it suits better. Are you scaling? Are you limiting the, the potential scales for specific object? Um, it, it depends on what we are optimizing exactly. Um, if it's some sort of value, um, we can possibly want to limit some of the instances, uh, some of the items. I was wondering in, in a case, in the case that you have a really, really complex uh, uh, shape, you might be able to consider a very tiny piece in the final solution. And then if there are other pieces that other objects that are easily fitting on the on the on the bin, you might you might increase the size. I was thinking on. Uh, having some sort of bias towards those those solutions. Yes, that's true. If you only want to maximize the total volume, some of the objects will get very large and others will stay very small. This okay. It, it depends on your objective, really. Okay. And you can change the objective in the 
Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, have you published this any um, papers recall, uh, according to this presentation? Um, at the moment, we haven't published anything yet, but uh, it's our goal to do that in a, a couple of next of months. Okay, I think it may be considered like a good starting point for optimization, because uh, as I understand, you find just a feasible solution. It is not local extrema, yes? yes. And uh, what is the maximum number of uh, items uh, uh, you consider it in your examples. Um, there's not really a limit, but eventually it will get really slow. So far, we tested with a maximum of about 10 items, but we will test in the future if we can get it to 100 or 1,000, if it's possible. Okay, and my question is next. Are you familiar with our works on the function technique for convex and non-convex polygons, packing a polyhedra? Jonas? Yes, sorry, um, I didn't really get the question. Um, can you repeat it? Yes, uh, my question is, are you familiar uh, with papers on the taking a regular polyhedra using the phase function technique? I just asked um, you Not really. Not really. Uh, I read some of them, but uh, it's not really my uh, my specialty at the moment. Okay. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for your interesting talk. And uh, and so and the next uh, and thank you. You use exactly eighteen minutes or with <laughs> with questions. Perfect. And uh, the next speaker is uh, Philip. Please. Your present, share your presentation. Uh, you have 18 minutes, uh, so with uh, questions. Okay, is it already on the screen? Okay. Um, good afternoon, uh, my name is Felipe. I'm from the University of the State of Sao Paulo. And this work uh, is fitting stock problem with two dates and variable processing times was developed with the advisory of Professor Adriana Sherry and Professor Silvio Araujo. Um, I'm, I'm going to present first our motivation, then the solution, the, the model and the solution method, then some computational results and final comments. Uh, well, our motivation is from the aeronautics industry, uh, where the due dates of some the, the parts of the plane can be far more important than raw material waste, uh, because we have uh, assembly lines with lots of investment and resources assigned, so due dates can play a, a very important role. Uh, and also, we have uh, an important characteristic that uh, um, we have a different cutting pr um, processing times for each cutting pattern, as we can see in the first part of the, the figure, uh, of the, the picture. And uh, different from other literature uh, problems as paper cutting, where any cutting pattern have uh, the same uh, processing time. So we're going to deal here with uh, this um, characteristic where we have different processing times according to the items uh, assigned to a certain cut, cutting pattern. Uh, well, the, the tardiness cost and material cost do not dominate each other. Um, with simple examples, we can, um, we can make sure this is not true. Uh, especially when we have uh, different uh, processing, uh, different processing times for uh, each item. Well, having this in mind, this motivation, we bring our main model. Uh, um, here we have the objective function with these two costs. So we have the tardiness cost. 
uh, weighted by um, for for each item, and then raw material uh, costs. Um, have in mind that the objects are homogeneous, so they have the same costs, and it's the the the, the sum of the uh, cutting patterns used, the amounts of cutting patterns used. We have a demand, demand constraint that must be met according to the demand of the items I. Then we have the tardiness definition, which is brought that the tardiness of an item will be the sum of all the processing times until the sequencing, um, the, sequ the, the production sequence where in which it is produced, the desire in, in, in which this item is still produced. And it's uh, subtracted by the due date of the item. And we have a final disjun disjunction uh, term uh, that is defined by a binary variable, uh, which is one if the item I was already completed until the sequence of production K or zero otherwise. And then the, the, the last constraint is the definition of this uh, um, variable, this, this binary variable, zeta i k, um, that is defined when the, it must be equal or less than the total of items produced until the sequence uh, we are analyzing divided by the demand of the, that item i. So this way, uh, if the item was already completed until the, the sequence, uh, the anterior sequence, it can be one, which will, what will help on the, um, the tiredness definition. And otherwise it must be zero. So that time must be considered uh, on the tiredness computation of that item I. And then we have the decision variables domain, the XPK, which is the use of the pattern, the cutting patterns P uh, on sequence K are integers, these zeta I K are binaries, and um, uh, the, the tiredness, uh, the total tiredness of an item I is a real variable. Our solution method is based on column generation. So we have um, the, the, the initialization with homogeneous columns. The restricted master problem is run uh, with the integrality constraints um, relaxed. And then for each of the sequence, the production sequences K, we have a new column generated, uh, minimizing the relative cost of the sub problem that maximizes the value of the column that is added. Um, while we have relative costs uh, negative, we are adding new columns. And when we have for all the sequences K, we don't have any valuable um, column. We run the integer from the uh, an heuristic with uh, running the integer problem with the columns uh, generated uh, during the column generation pro generation procedure. Uh, we also added a lower bound uh, method for tiredness cost with dynamic prog uh, program pro dynamic programming method because the um, linear relaxation of the the um, the problem is not so good because of just dis disjunctive uh, constraints. And then with the results, we have the gap calculation. We added some valid inequalities that come to help to um, uh, constrain the, the space of solutions. So we have ZIK never decreases, uh, in all the production sequences an item is finished. And then the difference of between two consecutive ZIK uh, of an a same uh, item I uh, is limited to the complement fraction of what's produced in K. This is the column generation, the, 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 the next, next set problem of the column generation sub problem. We have the minimizing of the relative cost of the new cutting pattern. And here we have three terms because the 
the columns are used in three, three of the constraints. We have the knapsack constraint that must respect the size of the object. And then we have the definition of the processing time of that cutting pattern, which is defined by the sum of the amounts of items. Here we have um, uh, uh, an assumption that the processing time is unitary for all the items because it's uh, coherent co with um, a socket process. The, the well in the the, the 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 variable the decision variables domain are, is integer. The lower bound uh, method with dynamic programming. Uh, it was necessary or it was uh, an improvement because uh, the linear relaxation of the master problem is weak, mainly due to the disjunctive constraints uh, used to define the tiredness term of the penalties. penalties. And we proposed a lower bound method which separated the computation for raw materials and tiredness. For raw materials, we used the conventional cutting stock problem. And for tiredness, we used a dynamic programming method based on Tanaka uh, et al. in 2009, where the states uh, of the network is the, of the net are the scheduling times. And we assigned some pen uh, penalties uh, for assigning each of the production orders. And also, um, when we assigned the two consecutive uh, equal, um, equal orders, production orders in consecutive um, uh, schedules, it's also penalized so that the, the, the net improved as a lower bound. Uh, once we can assign uh, more than once uh, a single um, a single order and we are not uh, constrained to assign all of them, it's just a lower bound, not uh, a solution method. Then uh, we'll show some of our results. First, we, we, we presented an illustrative instance, which has uh, the 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 role to, to show that a sequential uh, approach uh, does not guarantee um, an amenable solution. So if we first uh, optimize just the cutting stock problems and then sequence it, we don't have the, the, the um, we cannot have, okay, we can have not the best solution. When we integrate, we have improved the, the, the value of it. Then we have an industrial instancing uh, instance that was collected on, on the factory that motivated that study. We have one week of demand of that uh, saw cutting process, and we compared it with a simulation of an empirical heuristic that was uh, understood from the shop floor uh, on the factory. And we have an economy with what well, we're using our proposed model and including we in raw materials. So, and the, the most part of the value was from less tiredness costs in more weighted items. Um, the, the total uh, cost reduction was of 42%. And finally, we have some random instances that were generated in order to understand which of the parameters make the instances more difficult or more uh, longer to have better uh, solutions. We explored uh, sizes of items with big, small, and variated sizes. Uh, we explored due dates with uh, due dates more tight with short uh, do they do uh, relative to the make span, medium and long? Uh, we explored the different wage uh, weights for, for the tiredness costs uh, with low and lower and higher wages, and finally lower and, and higher demands. Uh, and all these combinations were explored in five repetitions, so that we have a total of uh, 180 instances. 
each one of them were limited with, uh, to one hour of CPU processing time. The general results showed an average gap of 7.8%. Uh, the costs due to tiredness were uh, 11, uh, almost 12%, while the occupation of the raw material was almost 92%. The average uh, CPU time was 316 seconds per instance. Uh, analyzing each of the, the, um, the parameters is related. We can see here the tightness of due dates and, and a statistical analysis uh, using uh, analysis of variance. We can see that higher due dates make better gaps because it's easier to accommodate the, the tiredness costs. We have better occupation of raw material because tiredness are not uh, pressing um, for using worse cutting patterns, and we have better CPU times. So it's something that were expected, that was expected when we have more difficult um, uh, to attend due dates. We have more difficult to make better solutions. When it will, um, and those were the results that were statistically significant. When we look at the size of the items, all of the, all of the results were statistically, statistically significant. So the higher prevalence of big items um, has, as a consequence, better gaps, worse occupation of uh, raw materials, more material costs, and then less CPU time and less cutting patterns generated. Uh, mainly because big items let uh, worse combination of items to optimize the cutting uh, options. When we look at the demand of the items, none of the, the parameter, none of the outputs were influenced by that parameter. So we don't have uh, the demand of the items as uh, a relevant uh, input. Um, having in account the, the, the values that were assigned here. And finally, the wages uh, for tiredness costs, they were um, the, the, the higher wages for the, the, the average, the higher average weights for the items uh, had as a consequence worse gaps and less material costs. The worst gaps, we believe they were because the even with the dynamic programming uh, lower bound um, term, they were the, the, the this lower bound is worse than the raw material ones, the, which is the the, the cutting stock the, the classic cutting stock problem. And finally, uh, our final comments: we have we have had the object of exploring the integration of cutting stock problems with tiredness minimization. We had a uh, real industry motivation and we contribute to literature considering processing times dependent of the number of items on the cutting patterns. Uh, the computational results presented were uh, either illustrative, uh, real instance one, and finally some random instances to explore this impact of the parameters on the outputs. And we believe our next steps would be new applications in other areas, considering setups on the uh, processing time formation and also multi period approaches for the demands, um, as well as heuristics for bigger instances. Uh, thank you all for the attention and for uh, thank you the organizers of the ESIC of 2021. Thank you, Philip. Uh, any questions, please? Any question? As I understand, the time is over. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, let's close the, the, the day then. Thank you, uh, Felipe, for the last presentation as well. And uh, we are going to meet 
and thank you for all the speakers, uh, to all the speakers. That was a very nice, interesting day today. And we are going to meet tomorrow at um, uh, 1 p.m. Uh, UK, 2 p.m. Europe, and um, check the time. Um, so thank you and see you tomorrow. Nice. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.